everybody, I'm Jordan Rolfes from Beagle Rampant Productions, and welcome to our new series called Nerdinalia. I got the term Nerdinalia because nerd, where we nerd out about fun things, and from the term Saturnalia, the ancient Roman festival to honor the god Saturn. It was a big two-week celebration at the end of December, and it was a lot of fun and a good time and just an overall party, so I wanted to develop a new series where we could just nerd out and gush about some fun, geeky things, and the first thing we're going to be taking a look at in our new series of Nerdinalia is actually the Sega Saturn, which of course is Sega's... 32-bit answer to the Nintendo 64 and the Sony PlayStation. And, uh, yeah, I never had this opportunity to just sit down one-on-one, -on -one, YouTuber and viewer, with you guys to talk about the Sega Saturn. We've never had this really important conversation about the Sega Saturn. But that's all going to change today. It's uh, weird weather and lighting things going on. It's also really hot, so I'm sweating, and the kids in my neighborhood are getting ready to get off school, so you might get all sorts of those fun, crazy background noises that at Beagle Rampant is so famous for, but that doesn't matter because we are initiating our first celebration of Nerdinalia, and I'm glad you guys could join us. understand the Sega Saturn, let's take a look back at the previous consoles of the Master System and the Sega Genesis. The Sega Master System was an 8-bit console that was intended to rival the Nintendo Entertainment System, and in the United States and Japan, it was something of a complete flop. And it did a little bit better in Europe, but still, most Europeans knew the Nintendo Entertainment System. Nobody really knew the Sega Master System, so Master System was definitely a flop there. And uh, the term Nintendo became synonymous with video games in and of themselves, and Sega needed to get themselves out of this slump and uh, let the world know, hey, there are other options instead of Nintendo out there. So enter on the Japanese end Mr. Hayao Nakayama, and on the American end Mr. Tom Kalinske. These gentlemen went ahead and developed the Sega Genesis. So throughout the 1990s, uh, it was a 16-bit warfare between the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis, called the Mega Drive in every other region in the world, but that's how we do in America. While you guys use your Celsius, we go ahead and use our Fahrenheit. I contend it's 85 degrees where I'm recording this right now. And actually, it probably is 85 Celsius, because I am burning up. This house gets a little bit warm uh, during the summertime. But anyway, going back to Sega, it was time for Sega to start looking forward to the future. Uh, technology doesn't last forever, and 16-bit wasn't going to carry you into the next century, you know? So the future was clearly 32-bit. And this is the era of the Sega Solar System, where a lot of Sega's projects had code names based off of planets. We had the Sega Mars, which was a code name for the Sega Game Gear, which was basically their handheld version of the Master System, but it couldn't actually play Master System games. We had the Sega Mars, which was the Sega 32X, and I detail that thoroughly in my 32X playthrough of Doom that I did for Good Friday, so go ahead and check out that video if you want the full skinny on the 32X. They didn't bother doing anything with Sega Earth. And Sega Venus was the Sega Nomad, which the Nomad is a portable version of the Sega Genesis. They were doing all sorts of things to sort of extend the Genesis's life cycle as they were getting ready for their next 32-bit console, but ultimately consumers were starting to think, okay, you're putting the Genesis on life support here, and this 
mentality could maybe have affected why sales of the Saturn weren't so good in the United States. They were really good in Japan, but they weren't so amazing over here in the U.S. The Sega Jupiter was going to be a 32-bit cartridge system, but the future really wasn't with cartridges by this point. Sega had started to realize, okay, we maybe need to go to a disc-based format. Enter the Sega Saturn, and of course, as you probably have guessed, they went ahead and actually named this one the Sega Saturn. And of course, the Sega Saturn can play audio CDs as was sort of a mandatory feature for all CD-based consoles at the time. And if you're ever wondering, what would happen if I put my Sega Saturn game inside of a PC, you'll see a whole lot of files that you probably won't be able to open, and you'll also be able to see the audio files for the games themselves. And incidentally, if you were to put your Saturn game inside of an audio CD player, you'll more than likely get a warning saying, Hey, dumbass, why are you putting your Saturn game inside of an audio CD? But you could potentially have a little bit of a game soundtrack itself. That was sort of a common feature for the Sega CD system beforehand in the early 1990s, and you could occasionally luck out and get some audio files once you put it in an audio CD player. Of course, I've heard rumors that potentially there could be some damage between the game or the audio CD player if you were to do that, but I myself have never experienced that, but I guess I'm saying the potential is possibly there. And then we have the Sega Neptune, which is a hybrid of uh, Genesis and 32X, and you would think, okay, why couldn't the Genesis do 32X stuff anyway, but um, yeah, that's kind of how things were, and we'll get to the Sega Pluto in just a little bit here. So this was definitely the Sega Solar System era. And uh, in late November 1994, Sega goes ahead and they release the Sega Saturn in Japan, and it does pretty well. It enjoys solid sales, and it's looking pretty good. It's pretty popular over in Japan, and it garners a lot of support. In the United States, they made a very clear effort to market Saturday. September 2nd, 1995 was Sega Saturn Day. So make sure you do all of your pre-ordering and save up your allowance and get all of your work done to make sure you buy your Sega Saturn on Saturn Day, September 2nd, 1995. They really wanted to make sure you understand Saturn Day. So on Thursday, May 11th, 1995, at the first ever E3, Sega gets up there and they announce that the Sega Saturn is available immediately for a U.S. release. And retailers were actually not happy about this because a lot of them didn't get the shipments. And nobody actually knew that they needed to be promoting this, and people were kind of furious about this. They were also not too chuffed with the system's $400 price tag. It was kind of a disaster for Sega at the very first E3 press conference there. And KB Toys ended up dropping Sega altogether from their lineup, so this was not a good situation for Sega to be in. And to add insult to injury, Sony got up there right after Sega and announced that their PlayStation unit would only cost $299. That's right, in a room with Sony, Sega ends up being the money-grubbing, heartless monsters. And, you know, okay, I do like Sony's products, they make great games, they make really good machines, but man, I hate their business practices, and they're so sketchy. But even then, Sega was the sketchy one there. Ha! <laughs> Surprise! Our console's now released, and this was a very difficult hurdle for Sega to get over at the beginning times there. And they never really got over this hurdle in the United States, and there were other factors that we're going to discuss in just a little bit. One of these factors is the advertising. The advertising in the U.S. was very generic. It was very basic, and sort of like what every other company was doing. It was 90s grunge, and it 
just felt the same as everything else. There was nothing really unique. There was no flavor or spice to Sega's advertising, although there are a few good excerpts here, and I gotta give a shout out to the YouTube channel It's Still Thinking for uploading the best of the best of the Sega Saturn commercials. One of these uh, gems is the Theater of the Mind. Welcome to the Theater of the Eye. sports. Uh, keep it down a little. Real fast. Optic nerve here. I am gonna need some help. Yeah, adrenaline! Real painful. Sega. Saturn. I love how in this commercial that they mention that the Saturn can render 500,000 polygons a second. Ironically, none of these polygons could actually be triangles because the Saturn's architecture didn't have any support to render triangles, so anytime you see a triangle on the Saturn, it's actually a square or a cone with one of the sides set down all the way to zero. And I could just imagine Sonic the Hedgehog in a kindergarten class and the teachers talking about shapes and they ask, what shape is this? And Sonic the Hedgehog gets up there and screams, That's not a shape at all! What are you talking about? And I also love in this commercial of the Usher guy. I mean, you would think with all of the Smashing Pumpkins concerts that guy has probably attended, that he would totally know how to handle a restless crowd, but no, he's just whatever, and I'm gonna need some help here, so... Actually, those are career aspirations. How do I get a gig as a nonchalant usher? Back in the 90s, it was common for one company to take epic pot shots at another company. So, let's take a look at this one where Sega goes after Sony, calling their PlayStation the play thing, which, as a Sony hater, I kind of got to chuckle at that a little bit, but let's take a look at the play thing commercial here. Let's compare Sega Saturn's games to games on Plaything. Sega has a long history of creating true arcade games. Plaything's maker has no such history. Sega Saturn gives you arcade graphics and gameplay that could only come from the power of three processors. Plaything has only one processor. Sorry, Plaything. You're not worthy. Back in the 1990s, it was way too common, disgustingly too common, for grown men to sort of put their heads through this thing and create this I'm a little baby effect, and oh, it, it weirded me out then, it still weirds me out now, and uh, some people still think it's kind of cool, uh, I just think it's sick and wrong looking, so yeah. We, we did some weird stuff back in the day, and I gotta say, I'm not too crazy about this robot voice. I can't really understand what the voice is saying all that clearly, and there's not a lot of interest or excitement with the delivery, and it certainly doesn't get me excited about the Sega Saturn, although I do love how they call the play thing unworthy. I mean, that is absolutely classic. And you gotta love how the Sega Saturn is mentioning their three processors. This was actually a detriment to the Saturn because a lot of developers didn't really know how to tap in to the Saturn's true potential. The three processors got in the way of a lot of their development and game production, so... It was the thing that they're marketing as a positive thing ended up turning out to be a very negative thing for the Sega Saturn. And of course we have the annoying head screaming, SEGA! I mean, my gosh, like I much prefer the more serene days of the Genesis where it just went, SEGA! And of course we have Sega taking pot shots at Nintendo, calling them Pretendo in this little gem here. There are lots of good reasons to go with Sega Saturn instead of Pretendo. We call them games. Sega Saturn has tons of them. Pretendo has just a few. It does beg the question, do you want to play or twiddle your thumbs? Face it, Pretendo. You weren't worth waiting for. Yeah, 
I just gotta say, I love the melodrama of this commercial, how the guy literally shoots the N64 with a rifle. That seems critically unnecessary, but it's also really melodramatic and fun, and I gotta admit, it's pretty cool. Even though I love the Nintendo 64, it's kind of fun to see someone be absolutely crazy. And, of course, in this commercial we have the quintessential 90s grunge graphics, the fast cutting, blink and you might actually miss the content of this commercial, and they refer to these games. These tons of games and calling Nintendo bogus and loser, but they fail to actually mention the games that are available to play on the Sega Saturn. This commercial is basically skeet shooting Nintendo and not actually selling Sega Saturn. So ultimately we can see the US marketing for the Sega Saturn was kind of an absolute catastrophe. Now, the Japanese method of marketing the Saturn was a little bit different. They had an actual character, and he is kind of an awesome character, and I really can't do him justice by introducing him, so we'll go ahead and I'll put some modest uh, subtitle translations here, a rough paraphrase of what the commercial's actually saying, but feel free to go ahead and click the subtitle button to get a actually good translation, but let's check out this character named Segata Sanshiro. <laughs> Segata Sanshiro literally has no chill. He basically just goes around beating up hordes and hordes of people, like these innocent seeming children over here. I mean, I don't even know why he's attacking these children. I would think that you would maybe want to sell this machine to the children. I mean, it doesn't seem too smart to actually go ahead and attack them. And you gotta love how Segata Sanshiro says, You WILL play the Sega Saturn! It's like, oh, you think you have a choice? No. You WILL play the Sega Saturn! It's kind of awesome. I mean, this is not a guy I want to mess with here. And of course, children are one target. He also likes to go ahead and beat up random people in a nightclub. <laughs> I mean, what were they even doing? It's not like they were doing anything illegal or scary or wrong. Why on earth did they merit this horrible, merciless, infernal punishment from a titan unleashed from the bowels of the inferno? I mean... My goodness gracious, and you gotta love how the poor girl at the end is begging Segata Sanshiro for mercy. But no. You want mercy? Why don't you go to Pretendo or the play thing? Segata Sanshiro does not show mercy because you will play the Sega Saturn. And of course, Segata Sanshiro, even when he's trying to be jolly and helping you celebrate your Christmas holiday, he still manages to make the kids cry. Sanshiro! Sanshiro! 
ゾンシュウ背形三四郎からのプレゼント三四郎ディスクもついているセガサタン I mean prosthetic face like why and it's it's a good prosthetic face too I mean it's not just like a weird looking Santa Claus mask it's he's wearing Santa Claus's face and knowing Segata Sancho he probably ripped it off of Santa Claus and glued it onto his own face I would not be surprised if that was the actual canon of this commercial take a look at this one for burning rangers <laughs> I also want this video to be a little bit of a Sega Saturn buying guide if you were kind of interested in starting a Saturn collection. The game Burning Rangers, if you're importing the Japanese version, could run you well, no more than 50 bucks, I would say. If you want the American release or the European release, you could be looking anywhere in the neighborhood of $250 to $500. So, yeah, it's a little bit rough on that one there. But going back to the commercial, don't you just love how Segata Sanshiro is, um, er, how shall I put this? Trying to pull the honey train into the station? Um, Trying to see if anybody salutes what he has on the green there, know what I'm saying? I mean, just move her out of the burning building before you keep up with that stuff, man! I mean, if you want to save her, move her out of the building! My goodness! Of course, Segata Sanshiro did a lot of other advertising for particular Saturn titles, but... And I do like these commercials, but this video's getting a little too long-winded, so I'm giving you the best of the best here. Ultimately, though, there was something missing. Have you guys noticed I haven't actually mentioned Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Saturn? Well, there was no Sonic game for the Sega Saturn. An American division, an American research and development division at Sega, was coming up with some vague ideas and sketches and... Thanks to Dr. Noob's Game Bits channel, we have this footage that, yeah, I could agree with Sega's lukewarm reaction to this product. It doesn't look like something I would rush out to buy, but ultimately this game became nights for the Sega Saturn. But yeah, the boss engine for the Sonic the Hedgehog game, Sonic Extreme, became Knights, and both the US and the Japanese version, hmm, you probably won't have to pay more than $40 as of this recording, of course. We did get one Sonic exclusive game for the Saturn, Sonic R, which is the best racing game ever, right? I mean, Knuckles can literally fly, and there's almost an element of exploration, which is weird for a racing game, and it's not actually exploration because the map ends up beating you. You gotta love how the paths are so clearly marked on a racing game. I mean, this is the greatest racing game ever. I do gotta admit though, I do actually like the music here. People are hard on the music on this game. I do actually kind of like it here. There is the Sonic the Hedgehog game, the Sonic Jam, and again, the US version for this could run you about $250. And the import version from Japan, hmm, probably no more than 70. But that's basically just an all-star collection that Sonic 1, Sonic 2, and Sonic 3 for the Genesis, and a little bit of a 3D interactive museum. So that's not actually a legitimate Sonic game. So there's no real Sonic the Hedgehog game for the Sega Saturn here, and Lara Croft here on the Sega Saturn, and again, this is pretty widely available, and you should have no trouble um, getting this squared away. She was originally going to be a Saturn exclusive, and this actually only lasted about three months because Eidos was looking at the sales numbers and they were absolutely horrified by what they found at the Saturn. So, for a while, Laura Croft was a Sega mascot. That only lasted three months, though, until her release on the Sony PlayStation, and due to the poor sales of the Sega Saturn, 
she would not see a release uh, on uh, Sega machines until Tomb Raider The Last Revelation on the Sega Dreamcast. I don't know how Tomb Raider sold in Japan. I don't actually have those figures or anything like that, but even though the Saturn was definitely a bigger hit in Japan, they still couldn't really curb the success of the Sony PlayStation with their vast variety of quirky games and RPGs and Nintendo with everybody's favorite and beloved franchises and Ocarina of Time, a game where a central element is ironically triangles. Yeah, something the Saturn couldn't actually do. I mean, they would look at the development ticket for that and be like, yeah, we can't pull this off. So, ultimately, in 1998, we had to say goodbye to our friend and hero, Segata Sanshiro. With Segata Sanshiro, I felt like a loser when I went ahead and turned on my Xbox that night. I really did. I felt like, ooh, I should be playing the Sega Saturn here. I'm not cool. I want Segata Sanshiro to think I'm cool, and I certainly don't want to end up like that rabble of innocent children there, so yeah, I feel kind of lame here. But ultimately, Segata Sanshiro was retired in 1998, and there were massive changes at Sega. Um, Irijirima became the Japanese head of Sega, and Mr. Bernie Stoller became the American head of Sega in 1998, and he made a quite clear message. The Saturn is not our future. They were developing the Dreamcast, and for the most part, Sega Saturn is now a cool bit of gaming history that I am perfectly honored to introduce you guys to and give you this buying and shopping guide. So let's take a look at the actual honest to goodness Sega Saturn here. So Sega Saturn, you flip it open, it's a disc machine as I mentioned. It's their fun little disc machine here. It's got two controller ports, woohoo, for two player action. The Nintendo 64 of course had four controller ports, so what can you do? But this is the Model 2 Sega Saturn. This is the MK80,000A, uh, not to be confused with the MK80,000, which is the Model 1 Saturn. What's the difference? Mostly cosmetic. The Sega logo is here on the other one. The buttons look a little bit different with different looking text, but ultimately no difference at all. So if someone's trying to sell you this and say, hey, these versions are different, you should pay more, uh, no, uh, don't fall for that because that is totally a scam. On eBay, I had kind of some difficult time getting good prices for this when I just did an eBay search for Sega Saturn consoles. But when I went to Google Shopping, I found a lot of the results on eBay that weren't really coming up when I Googled it in eBay there. So ultimately, though, I'd say for a... My gosh, like for a complete package with the controller, 
don't pay more than $80 for a Sega Saturn system. I was lucky enough to buy this system for $40 from a used game store, and you will have the best luck actually going to a store. Support your local businesses, you know? And you will have wonderful luck if, like, the person doesn't actually know what this is. If they say, that's some old Nintendo machine, then you could really pretty much name your price and get a good deal on a Sega Saturn here. But yeah, I'd recommend not more than $80. Of course, you could go ahead and import the um, Sega Saturn, import a Japanese console. The Japanese consoles on all models, even the first one, had this really swanky commercial here. Second model in the U.S. had the original Japanese controllers. The Model 1 U.S. controllers I've never actually held, but I don't think they'd be as glorious as this. This is quite possibly one of my favorite controllers of any console ever released. I mean, the Saturn itself doesn't really rank on my all-time favorite systems, but this controller does. This is a good controller. I am very satisfied with this. And, of course, for Knights, they released the 3D gamepad controller with a little analog stick, and I want to do this debate here. Who invented this? Was it Nintendo with the N64, or was it Sega with this special controller for Knights? I think the actual releases might have been within hours of each other. It was that close. I'm going to go ahead and give the crown to Nintendo, but I think you could make the argument for Sega. And of course, with the inventions of anything, you know, it could be other people were developing this, so the true wreath of victory could go to somebody completely unrelated. But I'm going to go ahead and crown Nintendo the winner of this one. We have the this cartridge port. And uh, no, the cartridge port is not for your um, Genesis games. As you can see, I mean, dude, this is like not even close. Like, it does not even want to fit at all here. So, the cartridge port here is for memory expansions and for your memory cards. And it can also play region. Um, games, region lock games, uh, with the Action Replay Plus version. So yeah, that's why you see me having a lot of the Japanese versions, even though this is a US console. And yeah, it just pops right on in there. You, mine's oxidizing a little bit here, so that's kind of sad, but yeah, it's, it is important to make sure you have some sort of cartridge backup, because if you see this screen on your Sega Saturn, that means that your Saturn is no longer able to save game data, and it also means that any data that was on the Saturn is irretrievably lost, and you will have to do that really amazing feed in Tomb Raider, which for me can be just as simple as jumping from one ledge to another, you'd have to do that again. So it is important to make sure you have a backup cartridge. The official ones from Sega, again, don't pay more than 50 bucks for one, and the Sega officially licensed ones will not be able to be region unlocker things. And if you do realize, hey, my machine, because with my Action Replay card, I can't really tell the Saturn to automatically save it to the card. You might have better luck if you're using an official Sega one, but I can't honestly swear to that. So what you do, we have a little battery port back here. You just... You just pop it up. I don't have fingernails, so I have to use a screwdriver to pop the cover. And the battery is literally right there. It's a CR2032 uh, battery. You can get them for like, what, three bucks at any drugstore. And you just pop it in, and you are good to go. Your machine will be able to save game data. And then if you're using an action replay one, or even if you're using a Sega one, you're probably going to have to manually tell it go from system to card. It's a little bit more complicated than it was on the Nintendo 64 or the Sony PlayStation, but 
honestly, with the Nintendo 64, I loved it when they just saved it on the actual cartridge, you know? I hated the memory card system for the N64. Plugging it in the back of the controller, ugh, it was such a mess. And speaking of the back here, we got our power unit for the Sega Saturn, we got our AV out, and any AV connectors or RF connectors for the Genesis will not work on the Saturn. And we have a communication connector, and again, we had this sort of nonsense with the Sony PlayStation as well, but the idea behind this was to hook up two different Saturns and have them play together with each other. So you hook one Saturn up to another, and there you go. And it really wasn't all that good, and I never understood why that was an actual thing back then, but the PlayStation did it, and the Saturn does it, and uh, you had to have two TVs, two systems. It was such a waste, and I don't even know why they bothered with it, but Japan had a lot of really cool accessories with the communication connector. They had the um, printers and floppy drives, all sorts of fun things that you could go ahead and experiment with. I mean, there were several different variations. Japan got all the cool colors. They even had a version of the Sega Saturn that you could drive in your car, which it plugged into your car's cigarette lighter and it just... Man, that is some weird stuff there. One really cool thing you could also do with your Sega Saturn is connect it to the internet. And a really cool thing is it still could potentially work for online play because you weren't necessarily dialing up to a server, but you were calling up different Sega Saturns for online game play. So using Sega Netlink, you could still totally make that work. The connectors were phone lines, but um, you can buy a phone line to Ethernet adapter easily enough and experiment with that. That could run you I, again, I would say no more than 50 bucks, so, of course, eventually, and this uh, product only came to light not too long ago, there was the Sega Pluto, and the Pluto was a Saturn with Netlink actually built into it for online gameplay, but overall, the Sega Saturn, while a good system, I do have to criticize its lack of variety. My personal favorites for Saturn are Knights and a game called Enemy Zero, developed by Kenji Eno, one of my favorite game developers, but the US version of this game could run you in the neighborhood of $300 to $350. The Japanese version could run you uh, probably no more than $50. So, yeah, the Sega Saturn, a good system, but severely lacking in its variety of games and not the easiest thing for collectors nowadays. It could be possible to play backup copies, so, you know, you download the game from your computer, burn it onto a CD, and then put the CD in the Saturn. It works perfectly on the Sega Dreamcast, but for the Saturn you have to do a little bit more with that, and I don't really have time to go into all that, and it's not like I understood all that anyway. So, ultimately, Sega Saturn, I mean, I do love this controller. While the Saturn isn't my favorite system itself, this is probably one of my favorite controllers. I haven't held the Model 1 or the 3D Joypad, but man, I love this one. So thanks everybody for watching. I know this video was long-winded, but I now crown and miter you as Sega Saturn experts.